athlete, let alone Ironman world champion four times over. And I really have to pinch myself to believe what I've achieved. Um, I really, really do. I was, I was always a sporty kid, um, always incredibly self-motivated, driven, determined, obsessive, compulsive, and I'm sure some of you can identify with that. Um, but I channeled all of those characteristics into my academic studies. What I really wanted to do was excel academically. So sport was something I did very much for fun. I did it very recreationally, um, both while I was at school and then I, when I went to university. And when I went to university, I, I did join the swimming team. Um, I excelled on the swimming team. I drank for them very, very successfully. And, and my, my bruising biceps were huge by the end. But I, my sporting prowess uh, wasn't what I was uh, known for. After university, I, I went traveling. I went traveling for, uh, well, it was originally for nine months, but much to, my, much to my parents' frustration, I came back two years later. But it was while I was traveling that I met someone uh, that would change the course of my life. And at that point, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And I was starting to question um, the wisdom of that decision. And a friend I made in Africa said to me, very simply, Chrissy, look deep inside yourself and work out what your passion really truly is. And I have to admit, I had never done that before. And I realized that my passion ever since I was small was international development. Not that I knew it as international development then, I just knew it as caring passionately about the world around me and wanting to find a solution to the, the many problems that exist in our world. So when I came back from traveling two years later, I uh, did my master's in international development, international politi political economy. Um, it was at that time that I started running. Um, I'd gotten kind of puffy while I was away, so I thought the best way to lose that kind of puffiness was, was to start running. I hadn't really run before, so I started 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, obsessive compulsive, that soon increased. Um, and I got talking to my friend, and my friend grew up with a heart defect, and the year before, she'd run the London Marathon, and that got me thinking, well, I can run 60 minutes now, why don't I just enter the London Marathon? What is stopping me? If she can do it, so can I. So I entered the London Marathon. I trained obsessively and compulsively. There's a theme running through this. Um, and I surprised myself by achieving a time that I never thought would be possible for me to achieve in my secondhand trainers and, and secondhand clothes and absolutely no idea about training whatsoever. Um, and it was at that point that I started to run a little bit more seriously. So we're talking 2003 now. Um, I also got a job, my dream job, working for the government. I was a policy advisor on international development policy, so working with the UN to negotiate new environmental and development pol policy. I absolutely loved the job, um, but I also wanted to get some experience working in development practice on the ground. So I found a job uh, in Nepal. So I took myself off, again, uh, much to my parents' frustration, to Nepal. Um, when I wasn't managing water and sanitation projects out there, I was riding a mountain bike, second-hand mountain bike that I, that I bought on the second day that I arrived. And this was sport at its absolute rawest. And I loved every minute. There were no logbooks, no training programs, no structure. We just went up and down and up and down the hills. And we did this amazing adventure across the Himalayas from the capital of Lhasa, 1,400 kilometers later, arriving in Kathmandu via Everest Base Camp. And it was phenomenal. I think that was the making of me as an athlete because it made me realize, A, that I had a passion for endurance sports, but I had a capacity for endurance sports that I probably didn't realize that I had. So coming home in 2006, I thought, right, I'm gonna give triathlon a, a shot. So I entered a race, a super sprint. It wasn't particularly super, but it was very, very sprint-like because it lasted about 10 seconds. So I borrowed a wetsuit the day before a race, so never use new equipment day, um, before a race because I tried the wetsuit on and um, being a very inexperienced triathlete, I thought, oh, this fits okay. I must have lost like 50 pounds overnight because I got in the not so tropical waters of the UK in May and the wetsuit totally flooded with, with cold water, the gun went off, I couldn't even lift my arms out of the water and had to be rescued by a kayaker and pulled to the side. 
Um, that was the end of my not so super, but very sprint-like first race. Um, the second race went very, very well, actually, and I won it, and I managed to qualify for the World Age Group Championships. I threw myself into training, I got a coach, and I blew every expectation I ever had out of the water by winning the World Age Group Championships. And at that point, I had a big decision to make, whether or not to become a professional athlete. And many people think, what's there to decide? You give up your job and you become a professional triathlete. For me, it was a huge decision. I loved my job. I loved my job with a passion. And triathlon was totally unknown to me. I didn't know whether I would enjoy the professional lifestyle and I didn't know whether I'd be able to make a, a success and a career out of it. But I'm not the type of person to ever look back and think, what if? And I never, ever want to be left wondering. And I think we can all be fearful. We can all be scared of the unknown. We're scared of failure, fearful of failure. We're fearful of what we look like in Lycra. And I'm fearful of all those things too. But the difference is I don't let it stop me. And so at that point, age 30, which is kind of pensionable age for a professional athlete, um, I took the plunge, gave up my job and um, plunged into the unknown of, of prof professional triathlon. I never expected to do an Ironman. I, I became a, a, a professional athlete um, solely to focus on Olympic distance. But I think it was Brett that saw something, Brett Sutton, my coach at that point, that saw something in me that I hadn't seen in myself, and that was an Ironman in the making. So he threw me into uh, the Alpe d'Huez long course triathlon. I didn't need much persuading because I am a masochist, but you don't argue with Brett. So I found myself on the start line of this amazing race. If any of you go to France and you're at the end of July, do the Alp d'Huez triathlon, especially if masochism is your middle name because it's absolutely phenomenal. I loved every minute of that race. And at the end of the race, Brett said to me, Chrissy, do you want to do an Ironman? And all I said to him was, am I ready? And he said, yep. So I said, and so he said, get on the start line of Ironman career in five weeks' time. I did just that. You don't argue with Brett. Um, never in a million years did I expect to win my first Ironman race. And I remember speaking to Brett on the finish line, and I said to him, Brett, Brett, I've won, I've won. And Brett's very effusive with his praise. Um, big slaps on the back. He said, good job, kid. And that was it. Um, so, and I said, Brett, Brett, I've got my Kona slot, I've got my Kona slot. But it cost $500. <laughs> um, at the point, I had no money. Um, and he said, just, just take it, and then we've got it if we want it. Six weeks later, I'm on the start line of the biggest race on our sporting calendar, um, the World Championships in Kona. And once again, I never went into that race ever expecting to win or intending to fight for the victory. The, my measure of success at that point would have been top 10. I could not believe it when I crossed that finish line in first place. And it was so surprising to me that, I'll just tell you a little story. In Hawaii, for those that have been there, Hawaiians blow into these conch shells. And it sounds like a very dull, like this, not like a cow, but kind of similar. Um, anyway, I was running down the Leahy Drive, I was waving this mad British girl, waving the flag, waving the flag, really, really excited, and then I hear, Moo. and then I thought, oh no, they're all booing me. <laughs> they don't want me to win because they do not know who I am. Um, so I was, I was like, I was slightly worried, and nevertheless, I, I continued with this kind of mad smiling and flag waving activity, um, long after I'd crossed the finish line, actually. But... In all seriousness, that was the moment that changed my life forever. Not just because I'd won the, the biggest race on our sporting stage or our sporting calendar, but because I realized as soon as I crossed that finish line that I had the voice and the platform that I'd always dreamed of having. Um, and I was determined from that point on to use that position to its absolute fullest and make sure that I was the role model and the ambassador for the sport that you would all want me to be and that I used my position to raise awareness um, and garner support for causes and um, issues that I feel really, really passionately about. And hopefully I've managed to do that and will continue to do that um, in the years 
ahead. Um, I <laughs> thank you. <laughs> now, I just thought again. I talked really briefly about what I thought was my th think is my biggest achievement in this sport, and I think overall it has to be defying everything that I've ever thought possible and what ev everyone else has ever thought possible for what I and women generally can achieve. You know, every step of the way I've placed preconceived limits on myself and others do that too. Um, and every time I've reached those limits, they've kind of dissolved into the distance. And that has been the most empowering and enlightening thing about this whole journey that I've realized that my limits and our limits are not where we think they are. And that more is possible, especially for women in sport. Um, in terms of my, uh, a, a specific race that I feel is, is my biggest achievement, it has to be Kona last year. And I, I remember speaking to someone before the race, uh, well, way before I had the bike crash two weeks before, and I said to them, look, my, all I want is to finish a race feeling physically and emotionally spent. At Kona, I got my wish. I gave absolutely all of my heart and my soul to that race, and I crossed the finish line absolutely annihilated. Um, I overcame more than I could ever think that it was possible for, for my body to, to, to overcome. And for me, that was my finest racing hour. Um, and I realized then, and it was quite a liberating realization, that the true measure of success for me could never be the time on the clock. Although I'm so incredibly proud of, what, of my, my world records, I realized then that the true measure of success is whether you've done the very, very best with what you've got on the day, whether you give all your heart and soul to the race. And if you do, you can't ask for more because I, I feel that the time on the clock of, of, in Kona was soft compared to what I, I could potentially achieve and what I think other women can potentially achieve very, very soon. Um, but like I said, it was my finest racing hour because I overcame more than I ever thought possible. And I think that was my, my proudest sporting moment um, to date. Um, just to finish off, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why I've written a book. Um, it's been a really long time in coming. I've been writing it now for a year and a half. And there are, very, very, there are many, many reasons for writing a book. Um, Somewhat selfishly, I craved an intellectual challenge. I missed the intellectual challenge that I had working um, in my previous career. And I think that process of cathartic self-reflection offers an incredible challenge. It's very, very difficult, um, but I found it very, very empowering. Um, I also wanted to write a book as, means, as a means of thanking those that have helped me, both in terms of my own close circle of, of friends and family before triathlon and, and during my career, but also all of you guys, sincerely. And that's why I wrote a chapter called The Heroes of Iron Man. And what you'll notice if you read it is that all but one of the people in that chapter are age groupers, aside from the amazing, amazing Jordan Rapp, who hopefully you'll see uh, perform out of his skin tomorrow. But um, it was my way of thanking you guys for all the support you've given me and all the inspiration you've given me as an athlete. Because in all seriousness, myself and the other professional athletes could not, support, could not perform without your support. So thank you. Um, the main, main reason for, doing, for writing the book was that I've wanted a vehicle to convey some really, really important messages. But I felt that in order to be able to effectively convey those messages, you guys had to identify with me. And I felt that many people didn't. I felt that they put myself and other professionals up on a pedestal and see us as these bionic superhumans. 
in order to be able to convey the messages and make you believe that anything is possible, you had to identify with me. That meant you had to see the real me. And you had to see that I get scared, I get fearful, that I bleed, that I curse, that I sweat profusely sometimes. And that it's not always easy and it hasn't always been easy for me, including my battles with body image and, and eating disorders growing up. Um, but I hope that in humanizing myself, you'll realize that anything is possible for you too. It might not take you to Kona, it might not enable you to become Ironman world champion, but hopefully you can take the lessons from my life and my experiences and apply them to yours and realize that your limits are not where you think they are. Um, my last aim for the book and it's a lofty ambition, but I don't think it's pie in the sky. What I wanted to do was write a book that appealed not only to all of the triathletes out there, but that could be held and enjoyed by those that had never heard of triathlon, that had never heard of Ironman. And in that way, we can help increase the interest in our sport, garner sponsor interest in our sport, and increase participation in our sport, taking it out of its minority niche and into the mainstream. It might be pie in the sky, but hopefully my book is one way of getting triathlon into the minds, into the psyche of the majority rather than the, the minority and really opening our sport out to the masses. Um, so those are some of the reasons I've written the book. Um, I just want to finish off. I know you're all sweltering under the sun. Um, by thanking you once again for all you've given me and my fellow professionals. It really, your support really does mean the world to us. I want to wish everyone racing tomorrow all the very, very best. I'll be commentating and then out there cheering, like I said, hopefully hanging medals around you guys next when, when you cross that finish line. Um, you're my inspiration. Thank you so much for coming out here today. I really look forward to meeting some of you um, in the Iron Man Merchandise Store later. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, world champion Chrissy Wellington. As she mentioned, she's going to head over to the merchandise store where you can get a chance to meet her.